Once you have planned your data well, the next step is to go in and create the data structures that can data can be stored in. This is especially important if you're going to do the data connection using um, applications. So if you're going to sit at the office in ArcMap doing the data collection, or if you're going to use um, applications on the mobile phone or tablet, then the, creating the data structure is of course very important. If it's just for, you're going to do paper and, and, and pen methods, well, I will still recommend that you create the data structure first because it does help you ensure that the data structure is in order before you start doing the data. So it might highlight some issues that you had uh, overlooked in your planning process. So never mind how you're going to do it, it's a probably good idea to create the data structure first. And if you're going to do application-based data entry, then it's of course necessary that we have a structure that we can save data in. ArcMap can save data in a series of different ways. Um, the main types are geodatabases, uh, file, personal databases, and file ge uh, and shape files. Uh, but also larger databases such as uh, Oracle or the whatever can be used for more centralized approaches. I will recommend that you use file geodatabases. Um, shape files are good if you're going to share data with other people. But if you're going to use the application-based data entry, then you will, should stick to um, the geodatabase, or the file geodatabase. So we'll cover that one, but if you need any of those, they are very similar in their approach, so there's not much difference. Um, the first step will be to go into our catalog and create yourself a folder where you want to store your data. So if I go into uh, my uh, map running here, I have my started a blank application, uh, a blank document here, so there's nothing in it. And I'll go into our catalog and I will locate under my folder connections where I will have my data and I'll create a new folder and I'll call it uh, Rook Posters. But what I'm going to do is that in connection with uh, the elections to different uh, political units at the university, I will, um, will go out and do mapping of posters. So we have our folder for posters. Once we've got that, we can then go and start creating our geodatabase. So what we do is that we right click on it and say new. So we go up here on a book poster, right click on it and say new. And we can have these different things here. We can create a personal geodatabase that is an access database. We can create a file database. We can create um, a shape file and toolboxes and so on. But we'll use a file geodatabase and that's then stored inside that folder. And again, there are this called all posters. So, so I have now created a file geodatabase that I can store my data in. Um, the next step is that I want to create domains. Domains are, as I mentioned, subsets of data types. And the reason why we create them first is that the same domain can be used in many different uh, feature classes and in many different attributes. So a domain is not something that is associated with the individual attribute. A domain is something that is shared by all the attributes in the database. So therefore domains are typically created first because then when you create your attributes you can assign them to the domain. 
to create the domain, you right click on your database, say properties, because it's a property of the entire database. And there are two tabs, there's a general tab, and there's this domain tab. And this is where we then create our domains. Up here we type the name of our domain. So I'll say a student list. So that's the different uh, groups of uh, or organi student organization. Or maybe it's, it, the correct term would be student organization. So student organization. Um, a student organization is going, we have two student organizations at the moment, so we will um, have them as not a range from one to two, but as a coded list of texts. Okay. So, we, and the ones we have, we have one called S, Studenterode, and so I have the code, and I might write the long name. And then we have FF, which is Frit Forum. So those are our two student organizations. Um, so now I have created a, um, a list of, um, of um, po uh, a domain consisting of lists. I might want to say, okay, we're going to register exactly how many posters are visible outside the buildings. But if we want to count how many um, posters are inside a building, we might have a new domain, poster count, and we can count how many posters are inside each building. And um, we could then say that this was a integer and it's going to be a range domain and at minimum there are zero posters but I don't know if there would be any buildings at university with no posters in it and I guess that the maximum number of posters in any building must be a thousand so um, I have now created a domain that specifies that in any building there must be between zero and a thousand posters and then finally, um, some students, they have hung their posters illegally. There are rules for security reasons of where you're allowed to hang your posters. So, I will, we will, when we register our posters, we will also register whether they are legal. So again, there, that will be a... Uh, text and a coded value and I'll have legal both as code and as description and illegal both as code and as description oh. Oh. So, come on Duff. So now I have three domains in my database that I can use to control my data entry. So let's see, okay. And they should be stored down there now. The next step we can look at is creating the individual data sets or elements. We have three things that we can create in a database. We have a data set a feature data set, a feature class, and a table. A feature data set, that is our feature class, if you read, so a group of feature classes. So it's like a folder. So if you create a folder, we want to have lots of data we want to organize, it's a really good idea to create feature data sets. They have one additional little thing, that is that all feature classes in a feature data set share the same coordinate system. And 
We often, even though we only have one or two feature classes, will create a feature dataset just to enforce that they have the same coordinate system. So a feature set they are can be considered as folders, but we then often use them specifically to create a folder in which all the classes have the same coordinate system. Then we have our feature classes, our layers, so they are those that can have only points, lines, or polygons. And then we have attribute tables, just like a Excel spreadsheet, that only have no geometry associated with them. Um, so those are the main types that we can look at. So we in here, we can go in and set, right click on it again and say new. And as you can see before, when I right clicked on the folder and said new, that gave me some options. And I'm here, this gives me these options here. Um, these are not for data collections. So even though it um, might not be necessary in this situation, I will start out creating myself a folder feature uh, or feature collection. So I right click, say new, and say I want to create myself a feature data set. So a collection of feature classes. And I'll just call it hook. And in here, I can then specify my coordinate system. Um, it has found my default, my favorites, which is um, the one that we use in Denmark. Um, if you can't remember, you can uh, browse through the systems. Say, okay, if you're going to use um, latitude, longitude, you would probably use a geographic coordinate system and you can go down world and you can choose the VGS which is the one that is commonly used by GPS uh, units. Remember these coordinate systems they have two aspects they have what type of coordinate they are and then it ha they have a what we call a datum a model of the earth so what earth shape are we operating on and it is important that you consider your data set and use the right one. So in demo, this is the one that we use. Um, and if you haven't got it in your favorites, you can go under geographic coordinate systems. No, that's if you have latitude, longitude without any uh, uh, projection on it. We are talking about a projection coordinate system. So it's a Cartesian coordinate system. And we we'll go and use this, what's called uh, UTM because Universal Transversal Mercator, that's the system we use in Denmark. And we'll go down and find Europe. And down here in Europe, we can find this ETRS, European Terrestrial Reference System. And down here, we'll find a ETRS UCM Zone 32. Denmark is consists of Zone 32 and Zone 33. Um, but even though that book is in zone 33, we prefer to do the data collections in zone 32 because by default that is what we use in the whole of the country, even though everything that is east of Svoboslo is in zone 33. So we'll choose zone 32 as our coordinate system. And it will then ask us for, do we have any vertical coordinate system? So are we, the first one was our cylindrical coordinate system. Our second one is our vertical coordinate system. So if you're going to enter a uh, set data, we can, you have to choose one there. Um, typically in uh, Denmark, um, we could go and see, I've got this on my slide, my coordinate system. So I went down, these are the two common ones we use. So if you're using latitude, longitude, we will be going down and using the VGS, which is down as a geographic coordinate system on the world on the VGS. So if you're going to have data collection using latitude, longitude from a GPS, that was typically one you use. If you're going to use data collection in a smaller area, such as Denmark, we will typically be using a Cartesian coordinate system or a projected coordinate system. And the ones we use are under UTM, 
and in Europe and then this ETIS UTM zone 32 that's the one we're using in Denmark if we're using the set data we will go down and choose the ones we use in Denmark is the one that's called DVR90 that's the one we're using at the moment um, before year 2000 we use one that's called Dansk Normal Null or Danish Normal Null um, which is this was the data um, our vertical coordinate system that we used before basically the vertical coordinate system set what is the sea level so and we did basically change the sea level values um, when we changed to um, uh, using the EGIS in uh, back in year 2000 so if we want to have a coordinate system there we go then and say Europe and uh, we should then be able to find the DVR there as the one that we will use um, and hopefully also the Danish normal null there as the old one we can however just decide we do not want to use any so I'll leave it as no coordinate because I do not want to register any set value it will ask us for our uh, tolerance how precise is our data set and this gives us a default of 0 0.01 meters so that's uh, will be in tens of centimeters centimeters millimeters so one millimeters position that's fine enough if I needed to have higher position I'll have to use a coordinate system that is defined for a smaller area but one millimeter is more than enough for me so I'll just say finish and I have now created this data set here where I can now put data into it so I can now start on this one and say I'll create a feature class so I have created my feature data set so that's that folder with a coordinate system and in that I can create my feature classes Uh, a tolerance and a feature class the first thing the feature class asks for is a name if we can then give it an alias um, typically if we are working with a multilingual project we will use a name in English and then use different national aliases it will ask us for what type of geometry is it point lines and polygons and it will ask us whether or not we want to create M data, measured data. Um, measured data is something we especially use on networks. You know them from those small white signposts along the road where it will say how many units down, meters in Denmark are you down the road. So you can always, if you have an accident, you can say I am at this road, so at the, the post saying uh, 25.67 kilometers from wherever. So those posts, those white posts along the marker along the road, they are measured coordinates. So they're just giving you how far down the road you are. And ArcMap can also work, or ArcGIS can also work with measured coordinates. We won't be doing that today, so we'll leave that blank, and we will also leave our set data blank. So over in ArcGIS, as I just close this finger, um, what I did is I right clicked on my feature data set and say new feature class give it a name so this is my poster I won't give it an alias oops alias off oh, back back poster I won't give it an alias and my posters are just points that's where I located a poster I don't have any M and Z values and then it will ask for my storage and I just say default and I can then start specifying the attributes of my posters each poster I will register which student organization it belongs to and whether or not it's legal so student student organization 
and that's going to be a text and down here you can say I can give it a default value so if one of the student organizations of have 90% of the posters belong to that I can put in a default value and I don't have to type in value 90% of the situations I can say am I allowed to hang specify a null value so leave it blank or am I only allowed to um, have observations where it's filled in so is the student organization an important aspect of my poster yes so I can only like this I can only register posters if they do belong to a student organization I uh, don't give any default values and I can go down under domain here and then I can specify what is my domain and here it will be student organization so now it can only have one of those two values that I put into that domain that was that attribute I just register if they are legal or not and I also register that as a text and um, I'll then go down under my domain and choose legal so those were my um, informations about um, my um, my posters so I've now created two attributes the for my posters these are the ones that are mandatory so it has already created an object ID and a attribute for holding the geometry so I've finished on that and I can say OK. The other thing I'll do is that I will create a new feature class for buildings. Buildings. And they are going to be polygons. My posters for parts, you can see it on the symbol or the icon here. I'll create one for po for polygons that are uh, buildings that are going to be polygons, and I'll leave those defaults. And now I'm going to register um, number of posters, and um, I will leave that as a number, a long integer. And I'll go down and choose the domain post account. So now, remember, I created a domain specifying that there was, couldn't be more than a thousand posters in a building. And then I also create another one. I could have created a domain for this, but I didn't. But there are buildings at Rook that are no longer there. They have been demolished. But they are on even the most modern map because they were demolished about. Oh, three months ago um, so the maps have not been updated yet so in order to register if the building has been demolished since uh, that would influence if you might be wondering why there's no posters on some of the buildings on the maps well it would be important information to have that those buildings are in fact not there any longer so demolished and um, I could do that in different ways. Uh, I could have it as a short integer, a set with a one for demo uh, for demolished, zero for non-demolished, um, and you can see it doesn't give us a choice for a having a domain. I will give it a default of zero because. Um, buildings are typically still there so there's only some of them that have been demolished so I have it over zero as its default and I can say finish and then say yeah yeah fine uh, and go back into my database and say oh I forgot to create a domain and go up and say demolished and create that as a short integer coded list code zero not demolished code one d 
demolished. So now, now I've created a domain after I've created the attribute because, oh, we hadn't thought about that. So we'll say, okay. And then we'll have to go back into our buildings, right click on them, say properties, bring up the fields um, there, find our demolished. And now you can see it has got a domain because there's now a domain of that data type, short type, integer, and I can then choose my domain. So even though if I had forgotten a domain, I can go in and add it after I've created the attributes. So, I have now created my data structure. I have given my feature classes a name, I have given them aliases, no I didn't. Uh, I have given them points, lines and polygons, to geometry. I've considered whether or not to use mData and setData. I have entered the attribute, so I've given the attribute name. I have chosen a data type. I have entered additional controls such as are they allowed to be null, what, how long are they, do they belong to a domain. So all of these things have been done and um, I'm basically ready to start creating a data structure or, that, or start creating the data, but that will be covered in another video.